Good morning and welcome to the AANMC webinar, Changing Your Career to Naturopathic Medicine. I'm Dr. Joanne Yanez. I'm the Executive Director for the Association of Accredited Naturopathic Medical Colleges and really, really happy to have you with me. First off, I want to say Happy New Year. And today's webinar is kind of in line with the new year and new thinking and how do we want to envision our future. Uh, do we like what we've done? How do we want to improve upon ourselves? And if changing your career is in the cards for you as a way to improve your life and your career and your satisfaction, then today is the right place for you to be. So uh, what we're going to do first is uh, introduce our two speakers. So with me today, I have uh, Dr. Jill Jennings and Dr. Ginger Sweden. And, uh, <clears throat> and they're just going to share a real quick uh, update on, on who they are and uh, where they graduated from. And then we'll hear a lot more about their stories through the course of this webinar uh, and understand if you are thinking about a career change, what does that look like? How do you make it happen? What are the next steps to, you know, to, to take in your own path and trajectory to make that happen? So uh, with that, uh, Dr. Sweden, uh, if you want to just give a real quick uh, sure. update on who you are and where you graduated from. Great. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Ginger Sweetan. I graduated from Bastyr University in California at our San Diego campus. Thank you so much. And Dr. Yes. Jennings. Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I graduated from National University in uh, Lombard, Illinois, near the Chicago area. So thanks for having me. Fabulous. And before we get started, we're going to put out just a real short poll to see where you all are coming from. Uh, so we can we can do uh, help you out a little bit better. And um, let's see. It's hard for me to see my next screen here. So there we go. Uh, so while that poll is, is going and cooking, uh, we're going to talk just a little bit about what today is going to cover. Uh, so both doctors have graciously uh, share, uh, agreed to share how they have successfully chosen to change careers, uh, the difference that the MD education has made in their lives, uh, what tools they had beforehand from profession fr from professions uh, prior professions, and what that does to help in your own uh, career success as an MD. Uh, they'll talk about a little bit about a typical day, and then share some case studies of how they've worked with naturopathic patients. And and then I know the the piece de resistance, uh, the tricks to balancing work and life responsibilities, and I think that's something that we are all always trying to figure out. Uh, and then lastly, some advice for prospective naturopathic medical students. And so. Uh, what I see here is most of the folks coming are prospective students, which makes total sense for today. And uh, we have kind of a, a quick distribution from most around the state, most around the United States and a bit in Canada. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate you coming and, uh, and we hope that this will be helpful for you as, as you're thinking about your next steps. So with that, uh, we're gonna just kind of dive right in here. Uh, so, and feel free both of you to kind of jump in and, and share what you felt was most helpful. Uh, so the first question is, when you were originally thinking of this, when the light bulb went off for you <clears throat> of, okay, I wanna go and be a naturopathic doctor and you know not do what I'm currently doing, what was most helpful in planning that change? Maybe Dr. Sweeten, if you wanna start. Sure. How to get so, a out of where you were and how you made that change. Yeah, absolutely. So I am approaching my 50s, and in my early 20s, I joined the Navy. I was a U.S. hospital corpsman and EMT. And then when I got out after four years, or actually while I was still in, I challenged the California Vocational Nursing Board, got my nursing license, and then put myself through college, nursing, and with my GI Bill. So I knew that I always wanted to be a doctor, but I got ill along the way and I um, had kids. I didn't personally have them, but they're my children. And so I wasn't able to go to medical school the way that I wanted to or the way I thought I wanted to originally. But that worked out beautifully because what ended up happening is I ended up having a career in business. And then they opened this campus in California 
And I had vaguely heard about naturopathic medicine uh, from a friend when I was an undergrad. And so I went to an open house, I was sold, I found my tribe, I found my people. And I really knew that that was my calling in life. So I went home and told my husband and he knew I had always wanted to be a doctor. And so for us, uh, it just meant planning our life, uh, maybe changing how we were functioning as a family. Um, but for us, it was fairly simple because he knew it was coming. He just didn't know when, but in terms of having a kid, I definitely had to do a lot of planning. Um, where is she going to go to school when we're in work or I'm in school? Who could take care of her if a crisis arose? And we did all that because I feel like when you want something bad enough, you find a way to make it happen. And as far as perceived obstacles, I feel like the only perceived obstacles I had were in my own mind. And I was able to overcome those, just overcome those, just acknowledging that this is what I had always wanted to do and nothing was going to stop me. Yeah, my story is um, along the same lines as uh, Dr. Sweeten's is I, I worked in healthcare for over 20 years now, and I was an ER nurse for 15 years. But prior to that, I'd always wanted to be a doctor my whole entire life. That's all I ever wanted to be. And funny, when I was in my undergrad, I started working in the hospitals and watching these doctors. And I'm like, they're miserable. Why would I want to do this? Like, and the nurses are doing everything. So I'm like, you know, this didn't make sense to me to, to go this long journey to be an MD. And so after I got my bachelor's, I ended up going back to school and getting my nursing degree and did ER nursing for 15 years. And during that time, I had gotten sick and it progressed slowly over the course of about 10 years to the point I had seen every doctor at every test. I was on dozens of medicines. No one really knew what was wrong with me. I was getting ready to file for disability. And a couple of my friends said, you need to go see our naturopathic doctor. Now, at the time, I was like, what do they know? You know, I thought I had done everything. I thought I knew a few things about medicine. And, you know, it turns out I knew nothing. And in my desperation, I took his name and number and we drove 10 hours to go see this doctor. And to make a long story short, he got me well. And I was like, this is crazy. And I knew um, at that moment that this is the kind of medicine I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so I started looking into it. And for us, as far as planning and preparing, um, I applied and was accepted and said, okay, now what? You know, and so I asked them, how long do I have to enroll? And they said, I had three years. So that gave me time. And I think it, it ended up enrolling at about the two year mark to get all of our life in order and get our schedules in order and get our finances in order. So it was a lot of planning during that time. And then I was ready to go. And and like uh, Dr. Sweeten, as far as obstacles, sometimes you just got to jump in because you don't know if the boat is going to float until you throw it in the water. And it, it is, is a total mindset thing. If, if you put your mind to it, you can do it. Thank you so much. I'm glad you touched on that mindset piece. And Dr. Sweeten, when you said, you know, the biggest obstacles were your own self-imposed ones, can you share a little bit about what you mean by that? Sure. So, um, interesting story. I feel like I was a more balanced person in my 20s than I was my 30s because I entered business in my 30s. And I think I got very jaded and um, put priorities on money, uh, materialism, things of that nature. And so when I'm talking about obstacles, there were several for me. One of them was what would other people think if I went this route? Because I had always wanted to uh, be an MD. I, there was some embarrassment. There was, it was ego. It was absolutely positively ego. So I thought uh, I wouldn't be well respected. People wouldn't understand what I was doing, why I was doing it. And so, you know, I allowed that to play tricks on my mind, but not for long because I thought, all right, well, if people don't know what naturopathic medicine is, then I have an incredible opportunity to share with them what it is, what we do, and how I truly believe that we can heal humanity. So that was an issue. And then also, um, I have perfection tendencies. I want everything to be perfect all the time. And I had to let go of that. I had, and that took me a while. It was a process. And so it really happened over those four years. And I realized that there is no perfect person. And then it is absolutely positively okay to be authentic and to be humble. And um, so that was a transition. It was before school. It was during school. And obviously I'm still growing and, you know, hoping to become a better person every day. But really it was here and uh, it's a process. 
Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think many of us struggle as, you know, people think about changing careers, changing tracks. Uh, there's that mental piece of what you thought your expectations were and what yeah. reality is and what will truly yeah. make you happy and kind of getting to a place where you can make all of those coexist together happily <laughs> is definitely yeah. a, pr a process for sure. Uh, so uh, n I'm just going to move on to another question here. What was the most meaningful, uh, what was most meaningful for you during naturopathic school? So, you know, kind of moving gears from preparing for, for ND school and kind of getting your life in order and figuring out the finances and getting the family situation all aligned. Uh, what, once you got to school, what was, what was meaningful for you? How did you prepare Talk about that part, part of your journey, Dr. Jennings. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a funny question because I don't think you can prepare for it. Um, you think you can, but um, it's kind of like um, drinking from a fire hose. It's a lot of information coming at you really, really quickly. And having been out of school for a long time, it was a big adjustment. Um, but for that first question, what's most meaningful during naturopathic medicine, I think the thing that got me through was relationships. I had the most incredible relationships with my colleagues and cohorts um, in my class, and we just leaned on each other because it's hard, but it's totally doable if you've got your people to help support you through that, not only in your, in your home, but your people who are going through the same things as you're going through. They may not be have the same you know, life you have at home, but in the classroom and in the clinic, they're going through the same thing. So the relationships, hands down, was the most meaning thing, meaningful thing for me. And even today, um, I still keep in close contact with my colleagues. Um, but I don't I, prepare was rough because I, I was a go, go, go. I got four kids. I worked, you know, a, a job. And then now I'm, er, it's a screeching halt. I'm sitting in a desk for 30, 40 hours a week. And then, you know, 20, 30 more at home studying. It was like, you know, I wasn't used to it. I'm a go, go, go kind of person. So it was definitely adjustment. Um, and it, again, it's one of those things you have these perceptions of what you think it's going to be like, and you just got to jump in and get your mind right, you know, set saying, this is what I want. I know I can do it and I'm going to do it and, and then rally your support to, to help you through it. Yeah. Dr. Sweet. Um, I just really echo uh, Dr. Jenny's sentiments because I don't know. I mean, we all do our best. I think we try to do our best to prepare for anything that's important for us. And then we get in the situation and we realize that although the preparation was lovely and it is beneficial, it's not ideal in the sense that you really don't ever know what to expect until you're actually in the thick of it. So I say jump in. Um, but do be prepared in terms of time management. And I guess that's something I really want to emphasize is good use of time management. I like to use an agenda, an old fashioned one that you can write in. I felt compelled because I was in class with people who were using their computers for everything um, to try to use one electronically. I did that for a while, but I just went back to a good old fashioned agenda, wrote everything out, color coded it and stuck to it like really, truly stuck to it. And for me, it made all the difference in the world. Yeah, I think, I, you know, it's, it's all, it's very personal. And, you know, we talked, we had talked about, uh, you're mentioning time management and uh, what works for one person may not necessarily work right. for another, but I think the key point is know what works for you yeah. and stick to it religiously. Yeah. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, you try something else. And yeah. you must, yeah. But usually by the time someone is, you know, considering a career change, they usually have, or, or may, maybe I'm making an assumption, but often will have those types of organizational skills. Uh, and, and that's oftentimes one of the benefits that career changers come to school with, uh, is that you have that focus. And maybe if you can speak a little bit about some of the advantages of coming to school as a career changer. For me, um, my biggest, I think, advantage was, you know, obviously life experience. I was a, way older than the majority of my classmates, and I had a ton of clinical experience. So it was actually really, really fun for me because I kind of took on that mom role. I actually, in med school, was known as Mama J uh, mm -hmm. by my colleagues. And so it was really fun for me to come alongside them because a lot of these kids were 
right out of undergrad. They didn't have the clinical experience that I had. So it was really fun for me to mentor them in that regard, but just um, life experience. And, and, you know, we all at some point are, are pushed to take on a mentor role of, of some aspect in our lives. So that was really fun for me. And, and those life experiences, those clinical experiences really um, was so helpful uh, in my experience at, at med school and now clinically as well. Yeah. And I agree with all of that. I um, did have a lot of clinical experience as well, both in the military and then as a vocational nurse and felt like I had worked in so many different fields. I didn't work in oncology or cardiology, but pretty much every other field besides that. And that was really helpful. But I still feel like um, for me, it was a different environment with regard to responsibility. So having come from a business background and a healthcare background, I feel like that having a strong drive, some moxie, persistence, um, you know, maybe not a cultural pull yourself up by the bootstraps attitude, but somewhat that I was able to push through in times that were difficult and then sit with myself and acknowledge I'm not the nurse anymore, which is a wonderful and beautiful thing because, well, I'm always a nurse, just like Dr. Jennings, but um, now I can't call the doctor, like I am the doctor. And so then taking my critical thinking skills that I learned uh, in my prior careers and applying it to medicine, I felt like was really helpful. Um, and then just persistence and effective communication skills, which I think often um, people who've had prior careers are, I don't want to say they're better at, I would just say that they're more practiced and it definitely comes in handy when you're sitting across from someone who's very vulnerable and divulging personal details of their life. Yeah, I think you also mentioned something really interesting too, which was the ego. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, you know, we may have career changers who've been physicians, licensed physicians, either in, you know, the U North America or abroad. Uh, or other licensed healthcare practitioners. And now you have to come back into this humble role of students again, where maybe you might have been the leader on a, on a cardiac team or a surgery team or a whatever team. Mm -hmm. And now you have to take back that role and, and grab that humility and kind of check the ego at the door and say, you know what, I don't know everything. And, and maybe, you know, I, I have, I come with a great skill set of life experience and this and that, but I also have some things to learn that are unique to naturopathic medicine. And so kind of thinking of with, with that framework in mind, what was the most meaningful thing that you learned uh, when you were in school that maybe, you know, you thought, oh, well, I know a lot already. I bring all this clinical experience <laughs> to the table, but what, what really stood out to you of, oh, I, I, I did really need to learn this. What, what was that moment for you? Well, for me, it was that I know nothing and it's okay to know nothing. And of course I'm exaggerating, but, um, humility, that authenticity reigns supreme. That is absolutely okay to say to someone, you know what, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to research that for you. Or I do know someone who does, and I'm going to inquire and get back to you. And I find that people are really receptive to that, and they respect you, and that you build relationships that way, and that there's trust in being authentic. Thank you. Without a doubt. I, I agree 100%. And when it comes to the whole ego thing, we come from a background, we, we, we knew a lot about medicine in the traditional sense, mm -hmm. but I will tell you, I even worked very closely with my ER doctors. I still worked in the hospital when I was going through medical school and I would get, you know, they would poke fun at me and say, oh, do you have any homeopathy for that? You know, and <laughs> things like that. But, you know, they would kind of joke, but they would pull me aside. And, and when they were yeah. done, we're really proud of you. And we know that what you're doing is real medicine. And so they, some of them, if, if they're honest, they, they get it um, and they know that they don't have all the answers easier. And, and like Dr. Sweeten said, if you don't have the answers for us, we're trained to, okay, go back to the basics. Let's start with the basics. You know, the beautiful thing about naturopathic medicine is we're a tight group. And so I tell my patients, if I don't know the answer, I have two or 300 close colleagues that I will call on and say, anybody experience this? Anybody have any insight on this? And it's a really awesome thing to have in our back pocket to say, I've got all these other naturopathic doctors that I can ask 
what am I missing? What, what have, and like Dr. Sweeten said, the patients respect that when you're honest and upfront about that. Mm -hmm. They really do. Uh, so as you were kind of navigating this, did you have any doubts? And if so, how did you manage them? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know, because like Dr. Sweeten said, I always had a doctor right there that I could say, okay, what do I do? What can I do? What do I need to do? And now we are the doctor. So of course there's doubts. But again, you go back to, and as we went through school and we kind of practiced and we're in the clinic and doing it under our attendings, you realize, okay, if I don't know, I go back to the basics. Let's start there and use your critical thinking skills. And so those doubts are always going to creep up. But you always, for me, I go back on what do I know? Let's start with the basics. Let's start with, you know, what the body needs, what the body is, doesn't need. Let's start there. And, and you come back to those things that you don't know. And sometimes we, we, we get too far ahead of ourselves and we have to just slow down and go back to basics. Yeah. Great point. I, I had some doubts too. I had, I mean, I would say the most of my doubts because I was so ego led and thinking, Oh, I'm wonderful. They, you know, this program is lucky to have me. <laughs> now I look back and think, Oh my gosh, I'm surprised they admitted me. I was really full of myself. Um, but when I look back, I would say that most of the doubt was happening during the four year process because it's not that the material itself is unlearnable it is absolutely learnable we've all we've done it it's just the amount that's consistent over time and there were several times that I was tired I was tired I was parenting I was commuting three hours a day um, I, I'm a caregiver to my mother-in-law there I mean there's a lot we're all doing a lot in our lives that I said you know what like I know I'm smart enough I know I can do this I know I can be a doctor but is this what I want to do and then that quickly passed for me, but there were numerous times that those things went through my mind and I cried. Or one time I failed an exam and I had never failed an exam before. And that needed to happen to me because I needed humility. Um, but it wasn't so much the degree as the journey itself for me. That's, that's a wonderful, uh, and you're, you're ahead of the game because you, you were only tired a few times. I, <laughs> I was tired a lot more than that. Uh, so uh, I, I'd love, I love your stories and I love what you're sharing here. Uh, one, one question came in that I'm going to just ask now because I think it's part of what we were discussing, which was how you prepared, and you both came from, you know, working backgrounds, how you prepared financially for mm -hmm. this journey. And if you wouldn't mind sharing that a little bit. For me, it was, um, I took out a lot of loans and I still have a lot of loans. I mean, um, several of our colleagues were blessed to have not had to do that. God love them. That wasn't my situation. And I, and I do quite frankly, carry a ton of debt. Um, but I knew, like I knew this is what I was called to do, and I knew that that comes along with it. So I'll whittle that down over time, and, and it seems like this unsurmountable mountain, um, but if you look at it as an obstacle, you'll never do it. Um, you know, you got to think further down the road. Um, we prepared the best we could, but for us, that was just a reality. I, I was never going to make it through without taking on that debt. Mm -hmm. Me too. <laughs> I, I'm not one of those people that was fortunate enough to um, have the money to pay for my tuition. I also took out loans and I still had uh, some loans from my undergraduate degree. So I too, Dr. Jennings and everyone who's watching, I'm very in debt. And I sort of console myself by saying, well, there's no such thing as debtor's prison. <laughs> They're not going to haul me away. And um, this drive, this passion, this need to be a part of this community um, just was the umbrella to everything in my life. And I'm okay with that debt because like Dr. Jennings says, you know, I'll pay it down over time or there's uh, debt forgiveness programs. But in terms of preparing itself, like how do you pay your bills? What does that look like? Yes, student loans helps with that, but I am married and I am fortunate in that my husband's salary was able to help us survive. We do uh, live in a family compound and 
my mother-in-law and father-in-law live with us. My sister-in-law lives with us and we have a lot going on. Um, so we needed that money and we're fortunate that because of his retirement from the military, we were able to do that, but I'm in debt too. <laughs> and that's okay. Well, I, I also <laughs> work through medical school. So I did work through medical school. Um, it's just something I had to do. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think for everybody, that financial picture is going to be different. Some people are, you know, going to take out some student loans. I had a number of classmates who were career changers. One was a flight attendant, and she still would do yeah. flights, and she, she worked on the weekends. Another was an accountant, and she did bookkeeping for some folks. We had massage therapists who would do little bits and pieces, and I was straight out myself. I was straight out of college going to naturopathic school, but I, I worked odd jobs. I waitressed here and there, and you know, you, you make it work and you, you, you know, yes. my, my advice to folks is always to take out as minimal on the loan as you can. But one thing that, and you know, their loans are in the news a lot and there's all of this fear of debt that people have. And if you, like Dr. Jennings said, if you see that as an obstacle and you don't see it as an investment, it's going to be exactly what you see it as. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you envision this as a ball and chain, it's an obstacle and it's an awful thing, then guess what? You're manifesting that. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you, you know, like, you know, I have a mortgage on my home. I don't see that as an obstacle. I see that as a blessing to allow me to live in a, a place that's really beautiful. And so, you know, I think we, it's, it's about how you frame things and uh, you know, and like you've been talking about the whole time, like you both have been talking about that mental, you know, that mental component. I'm not saying to go into debt to the point where, you know, your, your life is, is not functional, mm -hmm. but, but when people kind of put this big fear uh, and projection. There are many doctors who do really well, and the jobs are, the job mm -hmm. opportunities are growing for naturopathic doctors. They're opening up. But I always tell folks when you're thinking of that financial picture, come with a plan. Don't just like, oh, right. you just kind of willy nilly. Well, it'll work out. That that's not <laughs> that's not a good plan. Um, you should come in with you know with a financial plan and start your career planning and start to project how are you going to use this investment? What are you going to do with this when you get out? And what does that look like? And start to set yourself up for success with mentorship, with networking, and and all the works. Um, but you know that visual of not seeing it as a negative, but seeing it as an investment is is one of those mental things that I've seen be very important for folks. So would you mind sharing um, what your typical week looks like? That depends on the week, <laughs> honestly. Um, it ebbs and flows. Some, some weeks I'm very busy. Um, I love speaking. My biggest passion is speaking. Um, I try and do a lot of seminars because it's just where my heart is. Education is really where my heart is. So I do a lot of seminars on lots and lots of different topics and health talks and you know, I always say I'll get in front of whoever will listen to me because it really is the information that we have to share is life changing. So um, I love I love speaking. Um, I do, uh, you know, first office calls. My first office call is anywhere between two and four hours. It's very, very in depth. Um, so I block that off in my schedule if I've got a new patient. Um, and it's really fun to watch the patient's experience. They're like, oh my gosh, I've been here forever. Like nobody, doctor's ever been, you know, that thorough with me. So for me, I block those times off because that's when you're going to build their trust and let, and they're going to understand that you want to know everything about them so that you can heal all aspects of, of their health. Um, so every week for me is very different with follow-ups and new patients and speaking and, and things like that. So I would say I don't have a consistent schedule either. I'm a first year resident for anyone who didn't come in initially at an integrative urgent care and primary care in Encinitas. And then just this week on Monday, we opened a new office in Rancho Santa Fe that just does primary care. So I were open seven days a week at our urgent care facility. So I can work uh, Monday through Sunday, not usually seven days in a row. Um, anywhere from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., but it usually in eight-hour intervals, intervals, although sometimes I do do a 12-hour shift. And so if I'm in the urgent care setting, which has been most of the time, uh, somebody might come in thinking that they broke their ankle or they have pneumonia or they're having ear pain or a cough. Uh, those appointments can be fairly quick. And um, the fabulous thing is that 
people are becoming more familiar with what a naturopathic doctor does in the location we have in Encinitas, which is a coastal community in San Diego. They're more familiar, but I would still say a lot of people don't know what we do. So when they're in crisis and they're coming in, it affords me a beautiful opportunity to share with them what naturopathic medicine is. So while they might have a broken ankle or a broken arm and I have to splint it and refer them to orthopedics, I get to talk to them about all the beautiful things that I've been taught about our medicine and just connect with them on a deep level, a very foundational level. But um, an average day for me really isn't average because it depends on what walks in the door. Um, but seven days a week, potentially 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And I see all sorts of patients, pediatrics, geriatrics, women, men, um, you name it, we probably see it. And if we can't attend to it in the moment, then we refer out. Awesome. Thank you. So with that note, would you mind just covering quickly a case study that you, uh, that you presented here, Dr. Sweeten? I have yours up first. Yeah. So this is probably one of my favorite cases. Uh, it began in third year. And the woman, she's a 46-year-old Caucasian female, she was my patient on a phys med shift. I told her I was switching to the biofeedback shift just because we rotate around to different shifts each quarter at Bastyr in California. And she asked what it was and I explained to her what biofeedback was and she asked what it treated and I began to tell her and one of the things I mentioned was anxiety and her eyes lit up and then they sort of got teary eyed and she asked if she could come. So I worked with her for about eight weeks doing biofeedback, specifically a modality called autogen um, autogenics. And it's like a progressive, I don't want to say muscle relaxation, and I don't really want to say self-hypnotizing, but like a combination of both. And you come in weekly, you have 20 minutes of homework that you do at home, and it allows you to just function in the world differently by acknowledging what's happening to you physically. And I've never seen anything so incredible. Uh, within the first couple weeks, she began to report that the sweating she was experiencing in public uh, was diminished, that she was able to have more conversations with her coworkers and her superiors that she wasn't uh, calling in sick. She wasn't avoiding uh, social situations. And then she said something interesting. She said that she noticed that she felt better when she took Benadryl. And she also said that she had, oh, I went out to dinner and I had some seafood. I had some lobster and I started to feel like I was having a reaction. And I thought, oh my gosh, I wonder if she's having histamine issues. And so I did a little bit of research and uh, found that there was this connection. And so I had her switch to a low histamine diet and continue her biofeedback, and then also confirmed with some genetic testing that that indeed was the link. And it felt really good as a provider to just have that, I guess, concrete evidence that that's what was transpiring. And when I last saw her, she had taken a promotion and was working in a supervisory capacity. She was doing speaking engagements and she was no longer leaving the grocery store um, because of having social anxiety. And that was exciting and it felt really reaffirming of our medicine and what we do. Thank you so much. And Dr. Jennings, uh, I'm going to put your case up now. Um, yeah, so this first one uh, is probably my most exciting case. He was a 40-year-old male with two rare forms of muscular dystrophy, charcot marie tooth and hereditary spastic paraplegia. Um, it's funny because like I didn't we talk about not knowing in the doubts, like I didn't even know what these were. I had to look them up. And, it, and so I started working with him and the fact that they're both considered rare and he had both of them, he's only one of two people in the world who has what he has. Um, and it was really interesting. And his name is Brian. He gave me full permission to share any part of his story because it was that profound. Um, he was taken off of his job uh, four years, uh, near wheelchair bound, a lot of um, neuropathy, extreme pain, muscle wasting. He was in really um, sad shape and he left a job that he loved. He was a firefighter. Um, and so we started working together and it was uh, funny. He, he's a colleague of my husband's and my husband's like, you need to call him, you need to call him. And I'm like, you know, you just don't do that. And uh, 
So I reached out to him and, and I'm like, um, you know, I'd like to see if I can help you. And, and he, like me, when I was sick, was like, yeah, yeah, I'll try anything. Whatever. What do you know? I have the best doctors in the world, you know, and, and the specialists who, who took care of him are, you know, very um, select physicians. But we started working together and um, he was probably the most compliant patient I've ever had in 24 years, which is probably why he had the miraculous recovery that he did. But to be honest, the primary thing that we did was nutrition. We completely cleaned up his diet. I taught him what his body needed to feed his body into health. We took away the toxic things that he was exposing himself through, through diet and environment. Um, and in a very short time, we got his pain significantly down. Um, he lived at probably a 10 out of 10 most days, couldn't walk a block. Uh, mm -hmm. Within a couple of weeks, his pain was down to a two or three. I finally talked him into going on a whole food supplement just to flood his body with the extra nutrients. And within two to three months, every single symptom was resolved. It was the most incredible thing I'd ever seen. He was walking 10 miles a day. He, uh, it, was a, it was really, really profound, really awesome, awesome stuff. So that was um, unbelievable. I think we lost her. Um, I think she's probably trying to log back in. So I'll, I'll tell my other case really quickly. Um, my other case was a, a 40 some year old patient who actually came to me for um, weight loss. Uh, quickly, I realized that weight really wasn't her bigger issue. Um, she had immense amount of emotional uh, trauma and physical trauma. She was um, enduring, a, when, I, when you talk about abuse, this woman was not abused, this woman was tortured. Um, physical, mental, emotional torture, and she was going through um, a trial against her ex-husband for what he had done to her. And so we really started, I did a lot of homeopathy with her. Uh, we cried together. We prayed together. We just, I met with her every week for about four months while she went through this trial. And it was just so incredible. She did so well. Uh, and she just was able to withstand and do what she had to do on the stand against this man and, and thank the Lord, he was um, found guilty and, and sentenced to 85 years in prison. And, and we just have an incredible relationship. It was just that connection and just supporting her through that emotional trauma and using a lot of homeopathy with her. And she just did fantastic. So it's deeper than what they come to you on the surface for sometimes. And that was a really great example of how you just, you have to address the whole patient because you never really know until you get in there and ask them all those questions. Thank you so much. And sorry, I had some technical issues there. I don't know what the heck happened. My computer just went, went away. Uh, so the, uh, let's see here. Uh, thank you for sharing those cases, by the way, that, that is, I think, one of the things that inspires uh, us all as naturopathic doctors is seeing the healing that happens, especially in the face of when people have been told that, no, you know, yeah. it, there's nothing more we can do for you. Uh, that is beyond gratifying. Uh, so if you both wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about uh, some of the tips that you have found or the the tricks uh the magic bullets whatever you want to call them for balancing work and life uh and and setting those priorities and so forth for sure i think dr sweeten mentioned this before but priorities you got to set your priorities in line you know social media will suck you in every time and next thing you know you're three hours later like oh my gosh what did i get done so setting your priorities and um, scheduling is really, really key, especially if you're a busy um, you know, mom or whatever else you have going on in your life or you're still working, you've got to be able to fit all that in and be able to get done what you need to get done for school. Yeah, so I echo all those sentiments. I would say for me, it was a learning experience. I mean, really, these four years were quite profound for me. I feel like I'm a whole new person, which is amazing. I didn't anticipate that, but I'm thankful for it. So being around people who valued self-care taught me to value self-care. And so I found that I would, because I feel like I'm an overachiever, I want to do everything all the time and be involved in so much, but I found that I was learning to take time for myself. I was having quiet time. Uh, I wrote a lot. I mean, aside from the assignments, I... Um, I have a journal and I write aphorisms and poetry and the first two years I actually did a lot of that. It was really cathartic. 
So um, then I got introduced to meditation and I did some of that and I changed my eating habits. And even though I went to naturopathic medical school, I would not say that I spent a great deal of time out in nature prior to this. And so I really um, took the opportunity, any chance I had to walk out of school go over to some trees, take off my shoes and socks, ground earth, put my feet uh, in the grass. Uh, I live fairly close to the beach. I would go to the beach. Just um, really learning to take care of me because if I can't take care of me, I can't take care of anybody else. Physician heal thyself. Yes. What's that? Put, put on your own face mask before you put yes. on others? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mary, ask for help is the last one there. I think that, you know, we as women, we think we're super woman and we take on the world. I don't need help. But you get to a point where you're like, I can't do this all. And it is okay to ask people to help you with things. Yes. And that camaraderie, that camaraderie is amazing. Really, the people you're going to surround yourself with are going to be your friends, your colleagues for life. And when Dr. Jennings said, oh, I have 200 something plus close colleagues I can call on, she really meant it because we are a community. I found like no other community, even my military community who I love, um, your work community. To me, this was different. And I experience that even now when I need help. It's okay to say I need help. It's okay to ask for help. And it's okay to realize that um, we're imperfect beings. Absolutely. So, and, uh, and I know that a couple of you, you, you mentioned earlier, some of the online chat support groups, there are, uh, one of the good things about social media is that there's a lot of connection to, for naturopathic doctors on social media. And there are lots of different groups that exist. And you talked about, you know, 200 docs in one. I know that there's another group that has like a thousand, uh, you know, there are so many different groups depending on your area of specialty. There are uh, specialty associations for naturopathic doctors that that offer very focused uh, continuing education and support for doctors and mentorship and all of that. Uh, and so all of that exists. And I know we're, we're covering a whole lot here and there are a lot of questions starting to come in. Um, one thing I wanna mention is that with my little technical glitch, uh, some of the questions that may have been typed in earlier might've gone away. So if you haven't had your question answered uh, just yet, kind of uh, please retype that in and I'm sorry about that. And also please use the Q and A box and not the chat uh, so that we can monitor those questions that have been answered. Thank you. So with that, looking forward, uh, what advice would you have for prospective students considering this? What is that, that question of what, what do I wish I knew? Um, I think for, for me, for prospective students, if you're considering this, you know, for me, it's, it's prayer. I'd pray about it. But if you're not a praying person, find a couple of people that you really trust that know you well and sit down and say, this is what I'm thinking of. Will you help me even write out a list of pros and cons, thinking about all the ifs, ands, what's, you know, possibilities, and just fine tooth comb through that to see if the timing is right, um, the, the idea of going this route is right, and just really um, talk through that with them to see if it fits for you and for your life at that time. I also would say, um, find some naturopathic doctors in your area and go visit them, see their office, see what they do, ask to shadow them. Most of them are very open to that and just kind of walk a day in their shoes and see exactly what they do and then really decide, is this for me? And visit the schools too. Visit the schools, talk to the students, talk to the teachers. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of insight to be had there. Yeah, and, and I would say also reach out to the Naturopathic Medical Student Association. They're a wonderful resource and you can get connected with other students. Um, and there's several groups at each school, but there's always a Naturopathic Medical Student Association uh, club or organization at each school. Connect with them, ask them if they have any sort of mentor program, if you can come visit. I mean, you're, you're obviously gonna go to the schools and you should, and you should tour them and talk to people. But if you're moving to a whole new area, I think that it would be helpful. That's what I heard. I live in the area where I go to school, but that was one of the biggest things that I heard, people coming from out of area, that they wished that they had investigated more and had greater resources 
before they moved here. And not just school provided resources, but also uh, where am I going to go to the doctor? What does the insurance picture look like? Uh, where am I going to shop? What services do I need to have access to? And you can contact your local chambers of commerce for that as well. Yeah, then there's one piece of advice that I've heard over and over again for succeeding in naturopathic medical school, and that is to take a pen or pencil or type or whatever it is you want to do and write down your why. Why are you doing this? Why did you choose to do this? Why is this important for you? And, and keep it someplace safe. Keep it someplace where you know where you're going to be able to find it because there's going to be a time at some point during the course of that education for you. Uh, maybe it'll be four years or if you come up with prior medical experience, it might be a little bit shorter, but there may be a time where you're questioning that and it, it, maybe you got your first F in a class or you, you know, you, you know, somebody said something to you that made you question your motivation and pull that piece of paper or that whatever it is that you that you wrote that why down on and be really clear about it and uh, and to, to make to help get yourself back on track. And I've heard that from a lot of people that that's been very helpful over the years and during school to just kind of have that why and whether it's a meditation or a prayer or a, a whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, but to, to be connected to that source of why you're doing this. So we are getting a load of questions coming in. Um, before we do, I want to uh, just, uh, and, and I can talk a little bit about the academics. And I know a bunch of folks have been asking, well, what, is, what does the curriculum look like? What are the prerequisites? What do I have to do? And we have a lot of those, uh, all of those uh, resources on our website available. Uh, if you go to the prospective student section and there's a whole slew of uh, resources for prospective students about loan forgiveness and scholarships and financing. And you know, a lot of the questions that are coming in there are available on our website. Uh, but I, I did want to get some chance to get into some of the questions here. Um, so real quickly, I have up on the screen the contact information for Drs. Jennings and Sweeten uh, if you are interested in connecting with them further. And uh, before we get into the question and answer, we have some other upcoming events. Uh, next month, we'll be talking about eating disorders, uh, all types of eating disorders and how naturopathic medicine plays a role. And, and then the following month, food is medicine, which is so core to naturopathic practice. And I'm glad we're doing that one. And so uh, for any more information on those or to sign up, you can always go to our events page. Uh, so with that, I'm going to start to take some of these questions that are rolling in fast and hot and furious. So uh, let's see. Uh, I did see one question come up that I want to comment on um, that you're, you may be too old. I think the person who commented was 41. I will tell you my best friend in medical school graduated at age 60. She is brilliant. She is a phenomenal doctor. And if it is what God put in your heart or you believe is your calling, age has nothing to do with it. Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's one that, that we get consistently. And when we talked about that self-doubt, uh, the, the older learners, oftentimes uh, more mature learners may, may question, am I too old to do this? How am I going to be, you know, sitting in a room full of kids and, uh, you know, or I've been out of school a really long time. Am I going to, you know, is my memory still there? And all of that self-doubt that comes back. And, uh, you know, I, I had a classmate, I have classmates in their 50s, uh, and, and sometimes, and our valedictorian started school at 45. So, uh, you know, I think that you, you and she was an engineer before too, and I've seen some questions coming in of, well, what if I don't have medical background? Can I still do this? Okay. And absolutely, we ha I, had a cla I had classmates who were engineers, one gentleman was a construction worker, and he now has a thriving practice and is renowned in naturopathic approaches to managing drug addiction. Uh, you know, we had accountants, we had all sorts of folks, a flight attendant, like I mentioned. So you don't need a medical background prior. You need to do the prerequisites and definitely get connected with the admissions counselors to understand what your plan is going to be. Um, and the same thing goes with finances. I've seen a bunch of questions coming in here about 
financing the degree. I highly recommend if you're having those types of questions about what scholarships are available or financial aid yeah. and loans and rep federal repayment programs, which there are some that we qualify for, uh, connecting with the financial aid departments at the schools to get more information about that is really vital. Um, we're, we're not going to be able to cover that in, in the kind of depth in 11 minutes. So, uh, but definitely getting connected to the schools, getting connected to their resources is really, really uh, an important thing to do. So uh, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> I would say medical experience is not necessary at all no, but if you no. can get into some sort of medical setting whether it's even volunteering just to get in there and watch and see and learn would be beneficial if you can thank you and i, I also echo your your comments about shadowing or talking to other naturopathic doctors visiting the schools that you're interested in as well um and uh you know and, and definitely going through that um so uh there's a question about residency. Dr. Sweeten, would you mind uh, talking a little bit about uh, general, in general residencies, not necessarily yours, but just kind of the, the process and what that is all about? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I have very strong feelings and convictions about residencies because I, well, I'm in one, but also I think that um, it's, it's important that if you feel like you need to be in an environment where you have greater mentorship, um, before you go out on your own, although many of my friends, even since June, have gone out on their own and they're doing fabulously, including a prior pharmaceutical saleswoman. Um, but you go through a process, and on the website, I believe on the AANMC website, there's information about a residency. You submit an application, you then go for interviews, then you go through a process where you list in order where you would prefer to go. The sites that you have gone to interview at, they do the same thing. And then there is a matching day and you find out where you have matched. And our field is just so different from a conventional field with regards to opportunity that is unique and individualized. Meaning that you might go to one residency interview where they do uh, um, uh, focuses on mental health um, and, and maybe gut health at the same time. Whereas you go to another place to interview for a residency and maybe their emphasis is on women's health. So it can, or it could be very broad. So it could be very broad, it could be very specialized and you just have to find what calls to your soul and you can also go in preceptor through these programs before you go and interview for residencies to find out what it is that might be your calling because maybe you don't know and that's all right too. And then you do typically a year residency and pay depends on where your residency is located. And then at the end of the residency, you receive a certification that you've completed a residency in naturopathic medicine. Thank you. So um, one, of, one of the questions that is coming up is uh, in that life after school. And you've mm -hmm. spoken about you know, starting a residency, but uh, if for, you know, I know Dr. Jennings in starting a practice, uh, can you speak a little bit about, and maybe Dr. Sweeten as well, some of the folks that you've seen and what they've done to set themselves up for a successful practice when they get out. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, sure, I'll be really candid. My biggest challenge in uh, setting up my practice was business. I worked for somebody else my entire life. Mm -hmm. And although we had um, multiple business classes in school, that's been the biggest challenge for me is running. I could do the medicine all day long. That's what I love. That's my passion. But running the business, ugh, like that's the part that I hate. Um, so I would say hone in on running a business and running a business very, very successfully while you're in school, um, you know, watching how people do it because there's different ways to do it. And there's different, um, you know, things you need to know as far as marketing and social media and, you know, behind the scenes, business office running and things like that. So that was something that I, uh, I didn't feel like I was prepared for. Um, and I should have done a lot more work on the back end before the few classes that we, we did get, thankfully, in school. Um, but I felt I needed much more than that. So that has been the biggest challenge after school for me is running the business. So 
I love business and I could easily do that every day, all day long and help other people develop their businesses. But I definitely agree with Dr. Jennings because I think that if that's not your background, that can be really difficult hurdle. And I know that many of my classmates, we just graduated this past June, um, have been sharing via text message, email, social media, we're all connecting, like, oh, this is what I'm going through, what are you going through? And it's beautiful to watch us all come together and continue to help one another. But some of the biggest challenges have been around developing their business. But it hasn't prevented them from getting out there and trying it, uh, seeking mentorship. You can go through various local organizations that will help you develop business skills, teach you how to write a business plan, although you are taught that in naturopathic medical school. But I think it's good to have somebody who's been in the industry for a long time sort of handhold you through that because there's things that you just couldn't anticipate having to do and then they fall in your lap and you're trying to see patients on top of dealing with a business which could make you or break you but many of my classmates have been successful uh, there's a woman who's down in ocean beach she's doing cranial sacral she's a prior yoga teacher uh, she loves botanical medicine. She's developing her own tea formulas. There's another woman who's gone to work with a rheumatologist. She sees a lot of Lyme patients. Uh, she's very successful. I have a friend who was a model of all things, and uh, she was helping develop protocols and doing mental health. So I feel like that even though it might sound like it's scattered and all over the place, there's something for everybody. Mm -hmm. And if business is your forte, fabulous. If it's not, there are people who can help you. And you don't necessarily have to practice medicine in the way that you would think you have to practice just because you're a naturopathic doctor. You could do research, you could write articles, you could develop formulas for nutraceutical companies, you could develop products. There's just a lot of opportunity. Yeah, we have, we have a page on our website that talks about the various different opportunities available for grads and, uh, you know, new grads who are wanting to practice often will go and join as a junior partner in, in a larger practice, uh, but, but we are seeing folks bridging out to uh, academia and writing books and teaching and speaking and even the tech sector of all things and the, the nutraceutical uh, companies like you've mentioned and formulating new types of medicines and so on. So, you know, there, there are a lot of opportunities available. Uh, I, I, I am seeing a lot of questions and I see that we also have three minutes left. And so uh, for those of you who have asked questions that have not gotten answered that I can answer myself, I'm going to. So if you want to stick on the line, I will uh, respond to some of those questions. I'm sorry, I haven't got, been able to get to them all. Uh, but uh, the one of the things that uh, I would like to cover here is um, uh, sorry, just getting my getting my uh, my question here. Um, and just if you have any kind of last parting thoughts for our career changers who are on the line, uh, what what has what would be the one thing that you'd like to leave them with? It's just a really exciting, exciting field. Um, I, I mentioned on my um, pre-video that this is where I see medicine trending. Uh, people are, are really waking up and learning that what we're doing in mainstream medicine is not working. Thank the Lord for, for drugs and surgeries. There's absolutely a place for that. But for the chronically ill patient, you can't medicate yourself out of a chronic disease. It doesn't work. You have to get down to the root cause. So uh, it's really where I see medicine trending, which is really, really exciting for us. So if that's where you're being led, then do some homework, do some investigating, shadow some NDs and go for it. You know, we're really at the ground floor. It's been around for a long time, but it's people are noticing now. So that's really exciting for us. And I would just say, get real with yourself and get moving. Like ask yourself, you know, is this what calls me? Is it truly what calls me? What motivates me? And if it does, then you have a plethora of people with open arms that are welcoming you into a beautiful profession. Thank you. And so I, I just want to say a very, very heartfelt thank you uh, 
for both of your time coming on today. I know how busy you both are. Uh, and you know, there, there have been so many folks here saying thank you as well. There was one who was a mom of four saying, gosh, how am I gonna do this? And I know Dr. Jennings, like that, that's mm -hmm. been your, <laughs> your wheelhouse here. It can be done, you can do it. Um, I just want to address you all straight on. If this is your dream, if this is your passion, do not give up on yourself. Don't let do. other folks don't let other folks take your, your shine and your fire away from you. Don't let your own self-doubt take your shine and your fire away from you. If this is your passion, go for it.